together on this best week ever. Thank you that we get to have as much fun as we're going to have this week. And thank you that we get to worship along with all of these students and all of these adults, all these leaders. Thank you so much. Amen. specifically here at best week ever we're gonna have fun this week we're gonna make some memories this week and you know what there's gonna be times where we mess up there's gonna be moments that are gonna feel awkward everybody say that with me awkward have you ever had an embarrassing moment like the worst time to have an embarrassing moment is on your first day at school how many of you got school coming up here in the next several weeks? Every hand is in the air. And you're nervous, you've got butterflies. Your butterflies have got butterflies. I get it. Been there, done that, been embarrassed. I remember first day of high school, we had the freshman locker banks. All the ninth graders had their lockers together. And I was trying to act cool. I didn't really know a whole lot of people. I wasn't super popular. I had my backpack on. I had my trapper keeper. Do you guys even know what a trapper keeper is? A, a trapper keeper is you take a notebook and you wrap it up and stuff it in your locker. That's a trapper keeper with some Velcro, right? And so I had my trapper keeper, I had my cool shades, because I thought it was cool to wear sunglasses at school. It's not. I'm walking down the freshman locker bank, true story, and I tripped, and my trapper keeper went flying out of my hands. All my papers went flying, and some members of the football team were wearing their jerseys, and they just pointed at me and started laughing, and I felt so small. Has anybody ever felt embarrassed before? I've had lots of embarrassing moments. I know my buddy Big Rod has had embarrassing moments. Big Rod, would you mind coming up on stage right now? Do you guys want to hear from Big Rod for a moment? Big Rod, come on up here. And I asked you earlier to think of one of your, I know you've never been embarrassed. You don't embarrass easily. But if you would take the spotlight here and take the microphone and share with us from your heart. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, you guys are actually the first ones um, that's actually going to hear this story. I don't even think I've told my wife this. Um, oh, no, it's, <laughs> it's um, I actually was, I was about 14 years old. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Gospel Music Workshop of America. It's a, uh, God, yeah, oh, well, the Gospel Music Workshop of America is like a, a big um, conference for um, Baptist churches, pretty much, Church of God in Christ. Um, a lot of churches throughout, um, all over the world come, predominantly um, African-American churches. So when I was growing up, I had an opportunity 
to go to actually several other conferences, but the first one I ever went to, I was um, given the opportunity with the choir I was singing with to lead a song. And um, got up on stage, scared is all ever, and crying, nervous, in front of 30,000 people, probably plus. When I got up to the microphone and I went up to get the microphone out of the stand, my pants fell to my ankles. Yes. Talk about humiliating. But this is a, it was actually a rare opportunity that you get to actually go to this event. You know, you could go if you paid your money, but we actually had an opportunity to sing. So I couldn't, because the choir, we had to put in all this time practice and rehearse. And I sucked up them tears after I picked my pants up, pulled them up. And just to show you real quick how good God is, once I, I went ahead, trucked through it, tears, crying, embarrassed. But do you know, after I sung, people didn't even really remember about, or if they did remember the pants falling down, they didn't remind me of it. <laughs> but for that split second, I was so humiliated because I called myself, had a you know, girlfriend from the, Detroit, and you know, she got a chance to see all these sexy thighs, you know. <laughs> but yeah, in front of 30,000 people, big ride pants, I became the man for a brief moment. But um, thank God for his grace. Thank you, brother. So I redeemed myself. Give it up for Big Rod. That's embarrassing, having your pants come down like that. Uh, I had an embarrassing moment this past week. And if I tell you my story, do you promise not to share it with your parents? <laughs> because this is slightly inappropriate, but it's a true story, okay? This really happened. This past week, our family went to Florida. You guys been to Florida before? <laughs> Josiah knows where this story's going. Well, we, we, got, we got tickets to go to Disney World. So we were like, hey, we're going to Disney World. And the first day we went to Magic Kingdom and we saw the castle and we saw Mickey Mouse and we saw all the different things. But it was hot walking through Disney World. It was like 100 degrees in the shade, no exaggeration, plus almost 100% humidity. You know what humidity is? It's when you walk outside and you feel wet and you know there's gonna be a thunderstorm because it's just the air is heavy. So we're trudging through Disney World and by the time we got through the Jungle Cruise, not the movie, the actual Jungle Cruise at Disney World, I was starting to feel some pain. And I don't know if this is appropriate to share with y'all at church, but I'm just being real. This is, keep, I'm shooting straight. I was feeling pain from my thighs rubbing together. Like, you know how you get so hot, you're like dripping wet, you feel like you walked out of the shower and it's just sweat everywhere and as soon as you drink the water, it just comes pouring out of you from sweat. The sweat was gathering between my thighs. I mean, I had pit stains and then I... <laughs> There was like water stains from sweating, and they were, there was friction from my thighs and the, and the moisture, and I, it was rubbing together, and I started rubbing raw on my legs. I'm just being real, right? And it, and it was hurting. Like when it was time to walk to our car, I didn't think I was gonna make it, Rod. I, God is my witness, I about fell over. I was in so much pain. I got home to the hotel on Monday night and looked in the, the mirror, because you can't do anything when you're at Disney World. You're trying to act all cool, you don't want people to know. And I looked in the mirror and they were rubbed raw guys down here in the thighs. Like the hair was gone, the skin was gone, it was like almost bleeding and it was pain. It hurt. So the next morning before we go to Disney World, I say to my wife Amber, I said, Amber, Amber, please don't laugh. 
I can't walk normally. I can only walk like this. And my, my two-year-old thinks I'm Donald Duck. And so let's go to Walmart and see if we can get some medicine. I don't know if there's a bandage. So she goes into Walmart and she's gone for like 20 minutes. She comes back and she goes, I got the best stuff. It's a powder. I said, oh, is it like baby powder? She goes, it's even better. Here it is. She sets it out. It was called No More Monkey Butt. I am not making this up. This is a true story. Tuesday morning, I'm sitting in the parking lot of the Orlando, Florida Walmart. I cannot go anywhere to change my clothes because we gotta get to Disney World. I'm sitting in the front seat, kids in the back. I said, kids, divert your attention. Daddy's gotta pull his pants down. Because it's on the inner thighs, okay? Nothing inappropriate here. I take my powder called No More Monkey Butt. <laughs> Did you just snort? <laughs> we got our snorter. <laughs> right here. <laughs> She's snorting. And I kid you not, I had to, to drop my drawer. I look over, there's a guy parked there. Him, his wife, his kid, they're eating their morning McDonald's in the car, in the parking lot, and I'm just praying, dear Jesus, please don't let him look over here, or I will be arrested and put in the evening news. I, I kind of, I casually try to block the window, and I'm pulling down my shorts to apply my no more monkey butt. I can already imagine you guys going home tonight, and your mom is like, how was best week ever? Pastor John talked about monkey butts. <laughs> Something about his thighs. <laughs> you promised you wouldn't tell anyone, and Big Rod dropped his pants. I applied my no more monkey butt, went to Disney World, and then every three hours, I, I, mean, I, was, I was like, fine. It was like, it took away the friction, took away the pain. I was like jogging, doing, you know. But then over time, you start to sweat. And then you start walking and waddling, and I'd have to, honey, we gotta go to the restroom. And she's like, why? Do you need to put on your monkey butt? <laughs> and she would say it just loud enough so that everybody else would hear. And I, so every three hours, I got to be embarrassed. That was embarrassing to go to Disney World and you have to put on no more monkey butt. So um, we all have embarrassing stories. Here's the good news. This place is a safe place. When you come here Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, you are in a safe place where everybody here, you, you do not have permission to judge one another. You have only permission to accept. So if you make a mistake this week, it's okay. If you don't measure up this week, it's okay. We are not going to embarrass you. We are going to lift you up and raise you higher, and we want to level up. This message is called Level Up, No More Monkey Butt. <laughs> this week, uh, we're going to be camping out in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, now, I know you don't have a Bible on you right now because I saw you all playing in that mobile video game thing, and nobody had their Bible under their arm. That's okay. I want to challenge you, though, when you go home, try and find a Bible. Try and find one, or find a, an, a Bible app. And then tomorrow, when you come back, bring a Bible with you. Yeah, every person on your tribe who brings a Bible tomorrow, you earn 100 points per Bible. All right? And we're going to be in Luke 9, so make sure you take time to look at Luke 9 tomorrow. In Luke 9, Jesus talks about being embarrassed. Did you know that Jesus talked about being embarrassed? That, that sometimes people feel embarrassed at school. Sometimes people feel embarrassed at home. Sometimes around your friends, on your tribe, you feel embarrassed like you don't measure up. In Luke 9, starting in verse 23, Jesus gathers his followers, and they were all a bunch of teenagers, just like you guys. They were rising 6th through 12th graders, basically. And Jesus said in Luke 9, 
Again, in verse 23, Jesus said to all of his followers, if you truly desire to be my disciple, so if you truly desire to follow me, you must disown your life completely. Embrace my cross as your own and surrender to my ways. So Jesus said it's no longer about you. Everybody take your finger, your pointy finger, put it in your chest and say, repeat after me, it's not about me. It's not about me. One more time, it's not about me. Jesus said if you want to follow me, listen, you have to disown your life completely. It's not about your ego. It's not about you being cool. It's not about you fitting in. What if God didn't call you to fit in, but instead wants you to stand out from the crowd? And then he said, embrace my cross as your own. The cross is an instrument of death. You can Wikipedia this later. When someone was nailed to a cross, that meant they were going to slowly be executed and humiliated and embarrassed until they died. And Jesus said, if you follow me, you got to take up a cross. You have to die to yourself. It's not about me. And then he said, surrender to my ways. When you surrender, what do you, when you watch the war movies, what do they hold up? The white flag. If they don't have a flag, what do they hold up? Their hands, right? You surrender. That's why sometimes when people are worshiping on Sundays, you'll see them in the front row and they got their eyes closed and they put their arms up as an act of surrender, an act of worship. God, I surrender. And Jesus didn't stop there. He says in verse 24, if you choose self-sacrifice, giving up your lives for my glory, you will embark on a discovery of more and more of true life. So in other words, you have to lose your life to find it. Then he says in verse 25, even if you gain all the wealth and power of this world, everything it could offer you, yet you lost your soul in the process. What good is that? And then the key verse, verse 26 in Luke 9, he says, so why then are you embarrassed? Why then are you embarrassed? Why then are you embarrassed to be my disciple? Are you embarrassed by the truth I reveal to you? So this is Jesus. Imagine Jesus, the Son of God, right? And he, he loves his followers. And they're a bunch of middle schoolers and high schoolers. They really were. Only Peter was the oldest. He was 19. All the rest, some scholars say that John, he may have been 11 or 12. And he wrote a book of the Bible. So don't let anybody ever tell you that you're too young to make a difference in this world. And Jesus looks at these middle schoolers and high schoolers and he says, are you embarrassed to let people know that you're a Christ follower? Are you embarrassed that I am growing you up spiritually, but your friends, they are spiritually stagnant, and so you're embarrassed because you want to fit in with everybody at school? Are you embarrassed by me, Jesus says? And then he says this in Luke 9, verse 25, I, the Son of Man, will one day return. You guys know Jesus is returning, right? Did you know that every major religion believes that Jesus is coming back? Like, you can be a Muslim. Muslims do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, okay? Muslims do not have a high view of Jesus, but even in the Quran it says that Jesus must return. Our friends who are Jews, who are Hebrews, they believe that the Messiah will come. They don't realize it's Jesus. But they even say, yes, the Messiah must come. So everybody agrees Jesus is coming back. And he says it in Luke 9. He says, I, the Son of Man, I will one day return in my radiant brightness with the holy angels. 
and in the splendor and majesty of my Father. And I will be embarrassed of everyone who has been ashamed of me. I mean, just sit in that for a second. Jesus is saying, like, everybody is welcome to follow me, but, but you got to go all in. No holding back. No, like, covert Christians. No secret Christians. Like, what are you embarrassed by? What is holding you back from taking your next steps of faith? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of rejection? Because Jesus was rejected by everyone. Are you afraid of shame? Because Jesus was shamed by everyone. Are, are you afraid of being left out? Because at the cross, Jesus was led out of the city. He was nailed to a cross. He was left out of everything. All his friends deserted him. He was nailed to a, He was left out of life. He was sent to death. Any negative feeling or emotion, Jesus has already experienced it. So he understands how you feel. And he loves you anyway. And he says, follow me, and you'll discover your purpose. You'll discover your passion. You'll discover real life. Because when you realize that you're fully accepted by Christ, it doesn't matter what anybody on TikTok or Instagram or in the hallways or on the football squad or whatever, it doesn't matter what they think about you. Listen, they're not thinking about you. I promise you. Those other kids that you're worried about, I promise you they are not thinking about you. They're thinking of themselves. And they are concerned about how you see them. And so they will bully you. They will push you down to give themselves a, a boost of confidence. So when someone is a jerk to you, you don't have to respond back. You can feel sorry for them. That's why Jesus said you don't have to fight back. Just pray for them because, man, they are hurting on the inside. And they can't hurt you on the outside if Jesus has already said that you are loved, you are spoken for, you belong, you are chosen, you are his. Jesus isn't embarrassed about you with all your flaws. With, with me, my shoddy thighs, how embarrassing. I have to use monkey butt. How embarrassing, but Jesus still loves me. Even when I'm embarrassed. So Jesus says, why are you trying to keep your faith a secret? Why are you trying to be cool and fit in? Instead of inviting friends to 707 or the best week ever so they can experience life change. Maybe you haven't had that life change yet. No, it's coming. That train is coming. How many of you guys have been uh, tuned into what's going on in Afghanistan right now? Anybody, you guys have heard about the news, a few of you? Okay, let me ask you a different question. Show of hands, how many of you have a loved one or you know someone who has served at any time in the armed forces? Okay, so listen, put your hands down. This week, you need to pray for that person. Because all of our soldiers, all of our veterans, they're, they're going through a tough week. Uh, and this isn't political, what I'm going to say, okay? So don't worry, I'm not about to go into politics. Uh, right now, we're winding down our war in Afghanistan. We've been there for 20 years. So you've never known a time when we, when we have not been at war in Afghanistan, which blows my mind. But we're rapidly drawing down our troops. And in the past few days, the bad guys, they're called the Taliban. You guys know who the Taliban is? I don't want to assume anything. Uh, the Taliban are the bad guys that 20 years ago, we took them out of power because they had allowed an environment where terrorists could plan and plot to hurt Americans, right? So we went to war, we went to Afghanistan, we wiped out the Taliban, and we lost a lot of troops. We lost over 2,000 servicemen and servicewomen. And so we're drawing down our troops and 
winding down the war in this past week, if you've watched the news, the Taliban, the bad guys, they have suddenly, like nobody saw this coming, I guess. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe what I just said was wrong, but I didn't know this was gonna happen. They have quickly retaken over the country. And just yesterday they took over the capital and the president fled from Afghanistan. And so the bad guys that we spent 20 years trying to wipe out, it's like they just moved right back in. And so, number one, you want to pray for anyone you know or, or just for our servicemen and women because that's a tough, I, I can't imagine what that would feel like. I just can't imagine. I was talking to Anthony who was singing earlier and he said, you know, man, seeing that on the news, it just feels, you just feel sick to your stomach. 20 years of sacrifice and now the bad guy is back in power. But here's, here's where I want to share this with you. This is, this is all true. I, I planned this message back in February. That's, that's how much I care about you guys. I didn't know who was going to show up for best week ever with coronavirus. I know everything's crazy right now. I was talking to my new friend who has the video game station. Did you guys like that video game truck? Wasn't that awesome? That was amazing. I want that truck. That was flipping awesome. And, and we were just talking about how the coronavirus, it changed everything. Our school, some of you didn't go to school this past year, you were homeschooled. Or if you did go to school, you had to mask up like Darth Vader. I mean, it's just been nuts. And, and so she was sharing about how it's affected her business. And I said, yeah, our church, it's like we're restarting over again. Like everybody's just disappeared, it's crazy. But back in February, I knew we were gonna do best week ever. And so I planned for this night, I prayed for this night. And I planned this message not knowing that this week what would happen in Afghanistan would happen. So this almost gives me goosebumps because that's the Holy Spirit at work. I was going to share with you this true story. Um, over the past 20 years, we've been fighting terror in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya, all throughout the Middle East. There's a lot of Muslims. Now, Muslims are not the enemy. Okay? They are fellow human beings. They believe something radically different than what the Bible teaches. And some corners of Islam uh, believe in killing Christians and Jews. Okay? Not all Muslims believe this. I'm just saying there's a, there's a small group, right? And so you would see on the news these stories of, of these terrorists in the Middle East, and they would round up the Christians. And there's not very many churches in the Middle East. It's mostly Muslim, right? So they'd round up the Christians. They'd go into a house church. So someone opens up their house, their living room. Imagine you have church in your living room with like 10 or 20 friends. And you can't have a cross. You can't meet in a building because that would attract attention. And so these are called house churches or underground churches. I've been to these churches in Nepal and India. And they would round up the men and the women and the children. And, and some of them they would put in prison. This is just over the last few years. As you've been going through middle school, as you've been going through elementary school. Or they would figure out who are the Christians in this town. And so these terrorists would, would take spray paint and they would spray paint an, an Arabic letter on their business or on the side of their house. And this is that, that symbol. It's the Arabic symbol for the letter N. And it's pronounced Noon. Say that with me, Noon. And the letter N in Arabic, the terrorists would spray that on your workplace, they'd spray it on your house. I think we have a picture of that, of the spray paint. And it would say here, someone is working or someone is living that is a follower of noon of the Nazarene. They were marking Christians with that symbol. The symbol of noon for Nazarene because Jesus grew up in Nazareth. They would spray paint it on buildings, on homes. I've heard stories and I don't know if this is true or not. But I've heard unconfirmed stories from missionaries of this 
Arabic letter being carved into the skin of Christians to mark them. And then they were told by the terrorists in all these towns, either you convert to becoming a Muslim or you pay a huge tax or you pay with your life. And I live in the United States where I'm free. I can go to church, I can go to Best Week Ever, like there's no police stopping me, there's nothing, right? But this is not the case on the other side of the world. Being a Christ follower means you are marked for death. And this one time, I think it was in Libya, there was like 21 guys that, that were arrested. They were pastors and ordinary guys that just go to church and they were put in orange jumpsuits like they were prisoners. And ISIS put them on the edge of this uh, desert plain, and they all put on black clothes. The terrorists, the ISIS terrorists, we got a picture of this. They put black clothes on, and they lined them up, and they videotaped this as a message to all the Christians around the world. And they went one by one to each person, and they said one more time, you know, you are a follower of Nun. Will you convert to Islam? And one by one, each man would say, no, I, I cannot deny my master, Jesus. And then the man in black would behead them on camera. So there are men and women and children who are being killed for their faith. And now with Afghanistan being taken over by the Taliban, I have friends who are missionaries who are already sharing reports that once again, the symbol, the symbol of Nun, the Nazarene, is being placed on houses and on businesses, and people are being given ultimatums, convert or die. And right before I came on stage, I was looking at uh, something from my friend J.R. Lee. He's a pastor down in Georgia, and he said, here it comes. Now all the girls are not allowed to go to school in, in Afghanistan. They all have to wear burqas. And now all the Christians are being threatened. And he said, in the next few weeks, you're going to hear reports of bloodbaths, of mass extermination of Christians and people who have this, this symbol put on them. And so why do I share that? Because in Luke chapter 9, Jesus looks at his followers who are your age, the disciples. He said, if you truly desire to be my disciples, you must give up your life completely. Embrace my cross as your own and surrender to my ways. For if you choose self-sacrifice, if you die to yourself, giving up your lives for my glory, you will embark on a discovery of more and more true life. And in verse 26, he says, why are you embarrassed of being my disciple? Why are you embarrassed of the truth I reveal to you? Here's my challenge to you. There are teenagers, middle schoolers, high schoolers in Afghanistan tonight who are being marked. They're being singled out. And they're being told, okay, you can either turn your back on Jesus and follow Islam, or you may be killed. So they can either be embarrassed of Jesus, and they go into self-preservation mode and say, oh yeah, don't kill me, I'll, I'll follow Muhammad, whatever. Or, as you're going to see in the news reports in the next several weeks, they're going to choose death. They would rather live boldly what they believe, to live boldly for Christ, than to die an embarrassed coward. And I look at my own life, and I go, man, am I ashamed of my faith? I don't have to be preachy, I don't have to be judgmental, I don't have to be a hypocrite, but do I love people the way that Jesus loves people? Do I serve people the way that Jesus served people? Do I invite people the way that the disciples, they were always saying, come and see, come and see this man who heals and who restores and who loves generously. Do I have that kind of faith or do I need to level up? So I need to level up and say, okay, no more. I used to be embarrassed, but now I'm moving up, and I will bear that mark 
the mark of the Nazarene. I have something for you, and like I said, I ordered these back in February before this whole Afghanistan thing happened, so I didn't know that this was going to be in the news. I'm going to give this to uh, my friend Seth. Seth, come on up here, buddy. Seth, can you hand these out to everybody? Seth's going to hand out a, a button to you that I ordered way back in the winter. This is a button that has the sign in Arabic for Nazarene. And literally, in Afghanistan, right now, this is what's being marked on people's homes, on people's businesses, possibly on them themselves. And this is just for you to remember that you have the opportunity, you have the freedom to choose. Am I going to really live on fire for Christ? Or am I going to shrink back and be embarrassed about church? Because there are followers of Christ who are giving their lives this week, literally. And that's not what Jesus is asking you to do today. Number one, if you've never leveled up and, and started following Christ, then, then tonight's your night. And in a few moments, you can, you can make that choice. You can make that decision in the silence of your seat. No one's going to put you on the spot. They're not going to embarrass you. It's a private thing. You don't inherit your faith from your parents. Thanks, Seth. You don't inherit your faith from your parents. God has no grandchildren. God only has children. So some of you, you, you need to level up and get serious and say, yes, I'm following Jesus. Some of you, though, you need to figure out, man, am I embarrassed about my faith or am I putting on the button? Am I going public with my faith? The last session of Best Week Ever is on Sunday morning. The last session of Best Week Ever will be held outside. Your parents are invited, your friends are invited. It's at 11.15 this Sunday outside. Rod will be there, the band will be there, I'll be there. And we are going to do something special outside. We're going to celebrate baptisms. We got this huge tank, it's going to be beautiful outside. And maybe for you, your level up is to go public with your faith. There are middle schoolers and high schoolers in Afghanistan who are going public with their faith, and it's going to cause them to be imprisoned or killed. You have the opportunity to invite your friends, your family, your loved ones to church and say, come see me, come celebrate my baptism. There's no pressure, no, nothing like that, but you have the opportunity if you've never been baptized. That's, that's the outward symbol of an inward faith. And if you feel led to do that or you've got questions about that, in a few minutes when we break up into our tribes, you can ask your tribe leader about it. That's my challenge to you, though. So take this button home. Really think about this. When the stuff with ISIS was happening five years ago and that picture of the men, you know, I showed you, uh, I was talking to one of our volunteers here about it, and he was so moved by this symbol that he actually had it tattooed on his wrist. Now, I'm not giving you permission to get a tattoo. <laughs> Don't go home and be like, Pastor John said I can get a tattoo of an Arabic symbol. They'll be like, what? <laughs> but that's how much it deeply affected his faith, that he needed to level up. Maybe tonight is the night that you level up in a safe place, knowing that we're only going to cheer for you and hold you up. Can we pray together for just a minute? Close your eyes and bow your head. And just ignore all the distractions around you. Um, the scriptures say that God is everywhere. So even in your seat, this is a holy place. This is a holy moment. And you are loved. God loves you. He sent Jesus to die for you. So that you could be free of shame and guilt and embarrassment and live in forgiveness 
and in freedom and be your true self in Christ. Some of us, we need to level up. We need to stop playing games and get real about what we believe and to ask big questions and go to raw places, and not just surf on the beliefs of our parents. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you want to start a fresh new journey with Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to slip your hand in the air for just a moment. You can put your hands down and all you got to do is ask God. You don't have to have the right words. You don't have to say anything out loud. It's just the attitude of your heart. It's, you can silently pray this to God. You can silently pray something simple like, God, I don't understand this whole thing, but I understand that I need you in my life. And so right here, right now, I am trusting Jesus Christ to be my leader, to be my forgiver. God, help me to never be embarrassed about my faith, but to live it out, to love others, to seek your kingdom. Amen. Listen, the band is going to lead us in a time of worship, and there's about six of you, if I counted right, that prayed that prayer. And I want you to know that I'm proud of you and that you are loved. So we're going to stand together and sing, and then I'm going to come back up and give you some instructions. Anthony and the band are going to play. Would you give them a big, big welcome as we stand up together?
tribes so you want to find your tribal leader you guys can circle up anywhere on the premises for tribe talks and we'll meet back together out back at 9 10 9 10 leaders have your tribe out back at 9 10 
together with our differences together we are bolder braver stronger Maybe midnight or midday, never early, never late. He gon' stand by what he claimed, live enough life to say. I heard your heart, I see your pain, out in the dark, out in the rain. If you're so alone, if you're so afraid, I heard you pray. But the Lord ain't failed me 